being shown or anything like that, um, just put it in the chat. But we're here today to do the request for applications um, for a, a grant that we were directed to do through Legislative Proviso. This is a community health worker grant. Um, and so we're gonna be going over a lot today. You should have just been able to select that you are okay with staying in this meeting as we are recording so that folks who are not here have the ability to watch this today um, and to make sure that folks can reference back to it. Beth, is there anything else that you were hoping I would cover about the recording before I keep going? That's so funny. I was just gonna say, I believe we are supposed to say it again once the recording has started. So just the capture on the recording, everybody, we are recording this session. Yeah. Thanks, Beth. Um, and just so you all know, I'm going to be going over the content largely while we go through this next part, but Beth will be monitoring the chat. Um, so if you have questions, you can reach out to Beth. Our plan for today is that we're going to go over content and during that time, we're not going to answer questions. If you have a question while we go through the content, you can drop your name and the question in the chat. And when we get to the question portion, we'll just start at the beginning and start working through to answer questions for folks. Um, so if you have questions as we go, just feel free to drop those in the chat. All right, so our overview, um, we are going to be talking about just an overview of what the proviso said that we are supposed to be doing and what that means for this work as well as the timeline. We are going to be talking about the grant application, so details about how to find it and what to do with it. We're going to be talking about an evaluation of the grant applications. And then we'll also talk about some of the grant requirements that will be um, a part of whoever is selected as the apparent successful awardee and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. All right, so we're going to start with just a brief overview. So the, the item at the top, that is just the legislative bill for our budget. And so this is just referencing the part of the budget that um, indicates what we're, we're doing with these funds. There was not a like a bill associated with this outside of funding. Um, it's just that we had some proviso dollars that directed us to start a two-year grant program that will run from January 2023 through January 2025. The, uh, the language talks about um, hiring community health workers to work in pediatric primary care settings, providing outreach, informal counseling, and social supports for health-related social needs for children and youth birthed through age 18. It also directs us to determine if these funds are eligible for federal matching uh, dollars, so to be able to enhance on the investment that the state made. That is a work in progress, so right now we're going to do the awards based on the funding that was allocated to us, and if there's additional funds at a later time, we will send out more communication through the Pediatric Health Gov delivery around what the plan is for utilizing other dollars if able. And then we're also required to report on the impact of community health workers in these settings and any related health outcomes. There's a separate part of this work that is somewhat related, but is not necessarily a direct part of the grant process, which is to explore sustainable reimbursement options. This grant program is only for two years, and currently we don't have a sustainable model for after that two-year time period. And so this is really saying that over the course of the grant, we will be exploring those options and we'll be letting folks know what might be the options moving forward for having community health workers as a part of our Medicaid reimbursement model in Washington. This blue side is what we're doing to make that all happen from what the proviso told us to do. We're going to administer the grant in primary care settings, serving children, youth, and their families, and we will be funding 39 community health workers. Um, we will be partnering with the Department of Health to align um, our work with their CHW core curriculum, and they're actually creating new primary care models that are specific to roles for this grant. So this grant has two roles. One is an early relational health community health worker that will be working with kiddos birth through five, and then another is a K-12 mental health or school age mental health community health worker that will be working with folks uh, age five through 18 and their families. The other piece is, is that we will be um, continuing to explore if we can do federal match through the Medicaid transformation project waiver, and we'll be doing a mixed methods evaluation to just assess the impact and, um, and support around sustainability efforts. 
the awards for those 39 community health workers um, will be based primarily on application scores. However, we're going to be providing special consideration for clinics that are serving communities or populations that are underserved, underrepresented, and with greater vulnerability, as well as clinics with a higher percentage of children enrolled in Medicaid. And so that's just another piece of it. And with those two distinct roles we talked about, we're going to attempt to have a balance. So our ideal would be that we have about like 20 of the school age mental health and about 20 or 19, either one of those for the early relational health. Some important dates to think about. Um, we have um, launched the applications. They're open until October 3rd at 2 p.m., which you'll see is that teal box there. Before that time, um, there are deadlines around questions due from folks like yourselves. So you have until September 6th at 2 p.m. to submit questions. At that time, then it'll close and we'll update our amendments to go and reflect those answers. After that time, those answers are what are the, they? They are there, and folks will have to. To kind of figure it out, but uh, those answers will be posted on September 12th. On September 26th at 2 p.m., that's the deadline for folks to submit a complaint, and then October 3rd is when those applications are due. Um, I'm pretty sure it says in the RFA itself that folks need to have it in by 2 p.m., um, and it's a pretty like hard deadline in terms of, um, I would just su suggest if you have any internet issues, getting it in a little before that to make sure that it comes through on time. On October 28th is when we'll announce the parent successful applicants. So during that time frame from October 3rd to the 28th, we will be doing a review process, which we'll talk about a little later in this webinar, um, and we'll be working with our contracts team, and then they'll be um, reaching out to folks to announce if you have been selected. Uh, November 3rd is the deadline for requesting a debrief um, and for folks who may not have been selected. Um, we will be holding those debriefs in November, the 9th through the 11th. And then our anticipated start date is January 2nd. Um, the only reason it's not January 1st is that's a weekend. And so we'll be starting on January 2nd. The minimum qualifications for folks who can apply, um, you must be licensed to do business in the state of Washington or be able to provide a commitment that you'll be licensed within 30 calendar days of being selected. You must be a primary care setting serving children and youth. Um, I don't have that definition pulled up right now, but if that question does come up, we do have definitions posted on the webpage and also listed in the RFA. Um, and so we can also um, pull that up if we need to during the question section. And you must be able to accept Apple Health coverage without a managed care plan, also known as fee-for-service. We have a note up here at the top that um, we are not restricting that folks who are applying wouldn't be able to enter into a memorandum of understanding with a community-based organization, a behavioral health agency, things of that nature, um, if, if there's a desire to partner around um, places that might already have community health workers on staff and like working with them to have the community health worker um, have a contract for them to support the clinic in that way. The scope of work for this project is really that clinics are going to be hiring community health workers who will then provide direct services. Um, clinics will support CHWs hired throughout the duration of the grant. Um, there will be requirements around reporting on the impact, including both the services and the outcomes. And then there will be a need to partner with the HCA throughout this process. The big buckets that we'll go over is that there's hiring, onboarding, and employing community health workers. Their, their scope of work includes some clinic infrastructure pieces. There's delivery of services, community health worker supports, and grant reporting. We're going to go a little bit over these first four, but the grant reporting we're going to talk about later on in the presentation. So clinics um, are, will be able to apply for either the early relational health, the K-12 school age mental health, or both of those options. So you are not required to apply for both, but you have the option to if you want. We will be awarding um, folks based on what you request. So if you're interested in those, please just make sure you notate if you want one or both. We are also asking that the clinic team, the supervisor for the community health worker and the leadership of the clinic um, are able to demonstrate a readiness and a commitment towards community health worker success throughout the grant period. 
Um, we are asking that clinics provide a dedicated workspace and the necessary materials to support their job function, such as a docking station or a desktop computer, cell phones, laptops, things of that nature. We also are expecting that folks are able to have a confidential space to meet with families privately, um, that community health workers have access to it. This doesn't mean they have to have that private space all the time, but that they are able to have um, confidential conversations with those that they're working with. And then we are also including that um, community health workers are able to document within the clinic's electronic medical record within four weeks after the CHW's first day, really to have them be an integrated part of the health team and the services being offered. Some of the services and the CHW supports that are going to be expected as this, with this project for the delivery of services, um, it's really around supporting children, youth, and family, either depending on those different roles, so working with children birth to five or five to 18, through the, role, the uh, services of outreach, informal counseling, and social supports. We did try to provide some examples in the RFA through the example job description of what we're kind of thinking of are the components within outreach, informal counseling, and social supports, and that's also posted online. Um, and then also just develop and maintain sufficient written documentation to support the services that the community health workers are doing. The supports that the clinic would be expected to provide to CHWs um, is that they would be expected to have the CHWs participate in the Department of Health's community health worker training. Um, they do have that specific uh, content for these roles um, that they'll go over some general pediatric content and then they'll also have some specific pieces for working with kiddos birth to five and working with kiddos uh, five through 18. We also expect that clinics provide orientation and that they have the CHWs integrated into their care team. We expect that there will be a minimum of one hour per week of one-on-one -on -one supervision. So in the application, folks will identify who the supervisor is for the community health worker and will be indicating that that's the person who will be available and meeting with the CHW on a weekly basis to support them. And then we also expect that CHWs be included in the different uh, care team activities at the site. So that's clinic meetings or case conferences and things like that. Before I switch to the CHW grant application, Beth, do you have anything to add for the overview? No, I think I think it's great. And the the pace you're doing you're going at is, is great too, Christine. Awesome. Thanks, Beth. So now we're going to go a little bit more into the application and some of those pieces around what to expect. So some of you might already know this. We launched on Tuesday and we heard a lot of feedback from folks that our web's um, tool, which is our Washington electronic business solution, was challenging for folks um, and that folks were not wanting to have to register to see if they were interested in applying. And our communications and contracts teams um, heard all of you loud and clear and they have now posted a PDF version of the request for applications as well as the application packet and the example reporting template on our bids and contracts web page. I would encourage you to go to that page if you want to look at anything. Um, if you go to the web page, you just go to the current HCA acquisitions. There will be an option to click the drop down menu and you'll select request for applications and then it's listed as the community health worker grant. We do still link to some of this information information on the community health worker web page, but the bids and contracts web page is where you'll be able to get updates around amendments. Like for example, any of the questions we answer today, our contracts team will make sure the answers are then posted on their bids and contracts web page. So I just encourage you to, to go to that page to make sure that you're up to date on anything that we share. We still are using the Washington's electronic business solution webs um, as well. And so, you know, I still encourage for folks to register. The only reason we posted it on these other places is just so folks could access if you were still determining with your clinic team and others if you were going to apply. You can access the request for applications through the link that's here and that was shared out through the different messaging. Um, you are encouraged and to register as a vendor um, and you're also encouraged to complete the application packet with all of the required attachments and application questions. What that is is the, the full request for application has a lot of legal and contract language. The application packet is something that our 
contracts team put together. So you just have the things that you need to submit your application. And the first component of that is really, um, you know, basic information and a checklist of what all you might need. Um, and so I just encourage folks to look at the application packet. It was designed to, to make it a little bit easier in terms of the actual submission. If you do download the RFA, um, similar to what I was saying before, there just might be new updates and new amendments posted either through the web's site or through the bids and contracts webpage. Um, any questions that come up during today or subsequent communication for this RFA um, must be coordinated with our RFA coordinator so that it can be documented and answered in a written form as well as being posted and shared publicly so that all folks have access to the information that's been shared. And so if folks are like, why are Beth and Christine not <laughs> responding to my emails? Um, we have to loop in our procurements team to make sure that all the information is documented so that everyone has access to the same information. So before you start your application, if you are still interested in applying, um, a single organization can receive multiple awards for different service locations. But if that's the case, if you are an organization that you have clinics in five different places, you would need five separate and distinct applications for each location. Um, and so it's not that you can't have every location potentially um, seek out having a community health worker. It's just that we wanna make sure that we get the responses. And once you see the questions, it'll make sense. The responses should really be tailored to each location's um, distinct clinic roles and plans and things like that. I would encourage that you review all materials before you begin the application, just to make sure that you understand the full scope and all of the requirements prior to getting started. We also would encourage you to ensure that your organization's authorized representative agrees to all of the attestations. Um, so there's quite a few of them that are related to the pieces that we went over in the scope of work already around just expectations and requirements for folks who would be potentially getting these grants. And then the last piece is I would reference that application package that ha packet that has the cover page to just verify what additional documentation may be needed. That'll help just to pull out these like different pieces that you might need to pull from partners in your clinic. Folks do have the option to make an accommodation request. This is specifically around like internet access or language barriers um, that if needed, we could submit, um, we could offer a paper application or translation services. Um, you'll reach out to our RFA coordinator at our HCA procurements uh, email inbox. We will need to have accommodation requests by no later than September 9th at 2 p.m. And this is just to make sure that we can make sure um, we can set up translation or other um, the other accommodations in time to meet the deadline for the um, for the final applications due. If you're interested in this, what you'll send to that email inbox is the, your organization name, the primary contact person's name, phone number, and email address, and then your reason for requesting the accommodation. The core application packet components that you'll need to complete is that application cover page. And again, that's mostly just like background information about your organization, um, the support, your authorizing person. Um, it has a checklist of all the things that you'll need and it has some of the attestations. There's also an applicant intake form that gets a little bit more details that we might need. Then there's a section verifying that you meet the minimum qualifications that we went over. And then we have the CHW grant application, which is scored, and we'll talk a little bit more about the scoring next. You'll also need to submit a letter of support from the highest level of leadership within your clinic organization or if you're tribal from your tribe. We do have an executive order 1803 component that's required legislatively. Um, and if you have questions about that, I'm gonna look to our RFA coordinator to answer that question. <laughs> Um, and then there's some pieces around certifications and assurances and a COVID vaccination certification. All of those last three bullets, if you have questions, I'm gonna pull on our RFA coordinator to answer those. All right, I'm gonna transition us into the evaluation of applications. So the evaluation process, the first step is that all of them, all of the applications that we receive, our RFA coordinator will do an administrative review. This is really to make sure that minimum qualifications are met and that we have all of the pieces that we need. Then we'll do priority question scoring. So the priority questions, which we'll talk more about on the next slide, are ones that are pretty standard responses. And so we'll be able to score them administratively before we do a review um, panel. 
Then we're going to move into the narrative questions. Um, and the narrative questions, which we'll talk about in a couple slides, will have a panel that's reviewing them. And then the last piece is us notifying of whether or not folks are um, the apparent successful awardees. So after there's that administrative review, then we'll do a review for the special consideration priority questions. For these questions, there's a maximum of 40 points available. It's for four questions that are at the value of 10 points each. So the questions that we're scoring here are, there's three for serving communities or populations that are underserved, underrepresented, with greater vulnerability. And those three questions are around social vulnerability index and rural communities by county. And those go together, um, the social vulnerability and rural communities, it'll all be scored together. Then the next question is around the percentage of pediatric clients birth through five, through 18, sorry everybody, <laughs> served whose preferred language is other than English. And then the last one is around percentage of pediatric clients birth through 18 served to identify racially or ethnically as non-white. So those are the three first buckets. And then the fourth bucket is for clinics with a higher percentage of children and youth enrolled in Medicaid. And so folks will answer those percentages on their application form. And these will be scored, um, again, just administratively before we move into the narrative question component. The other part that's scored is our narrative questions. For the narrative questions, each question does not have a specific page limit, but the whole collection of them is an eight page limit. Um, so you can, if you can't go over eight pages, um, this will be for eight questions at 10 points per question. So there's a maximum of 80 points available. They're reviewed by an evaluation team, which will determine the ranking of the applications. So there's a selection of folks that will look at, multiple people will look at each application and they'll score it and then we'll do an average of those scores. We do have it in the RFA that evaluation teams can meet to discuss applications. That's really for if we have any outliers or the scoring is vastly different, that we can come together to discuss any challenges that we had around things that seem incongruent. And then evaluations will only be based on the information that's provided in the applicant's application. We do have here, I know it's a little bit small, the scoring. The scoring for these questions goes from five, excellent, which is you know really substantive descriptions and relevant information, a sound understanding of the topics, pertinent examples, all the criteria is fully met. Then we move down to very good is a four. I'm not gonna read all of these, but we'll post these slides online. Three is acceptable, two is marginal. And so when we're getting to two, it's really that there's minimal detail or insufficient descriptions um, or that you repeat back information that's in, uh, merely repeat back the information you've already shared. And then one is unacceptable that you don't explicitly address the narrative question. And then zero is non-responsive. Um, I do believe that we have something listed in the RFA that if there's a, a good amount of the zero to one, um, for several questions, we, we have the ability to not continue to review the application. So I encourage folks to make sure that you're really being thoughtful about, about adequately answering the questions we're providing. Beth, do you have anything to add about this piece before we keep going? I don't, I, I think that was thorough. And in the Q&A, if folks have additional questions, we can just um, address them then. Awesome, thanks Beth. So this next section is on the grant requirements. Um, so we did mention already that we are requiring that folks participate in the community health worker training that the Department of Health is uh, developing. Um, there are kind of two different pieces to this. Um, so the one is around community health workers themselves. The current plan is that it'll be about 26 to 32 hours of training. Um, there's an initial three-day in-person training that's about six to eight hours each day. And then there will be four subsequent Zoom sessions that are about two hours each to work with community health workers I do think that the intention was that there might be some additional time for them to be able to review materials and things like that as they're able in their job as they're onboarding. The CHW supervisors, um, there's four hours, um, four plus hours that are being planned for community health worker supervisors. And this is really to, you know, be a support um, to the, them in their role of supervising these new positions. The request is also that the CHW supervisors are able to support CHWs during the training when questions come up so that they could reach out to their supervisor if needed around like, what does this look like or what might happen if this happened? Um, 
There is the potential that community health worker supervisors might be able to join the in-person training. Um, and then there will also be the four subsequent Zoom sessions for an hour each. We included a note here that the current plan is for the training to happen at the end of February. Um, our partners at the Department of Health have been trying to kind of right fit when to offer it so that clinics that are going through this grant process have enough time to hire uh, community health workers and have them on staff and time to be able to participate in these trainings. We will have some grant reporting requirements. So there's three main reports that we're gonna be asking for. The first one is focused reports. These are reports that will be get submitted on a quarterly basis. They include information around community health worker service data. So are they doing outreach and formal counseling or social supports? How much time are they spending with families? Um, what resources were families requesting? Uh, we'll also be asking about clinic activity data, so around orientation, team meetings, supervision that CHWs are participating in. This is really, the clinic activity data is really for the purpose of us understanding um, how much of the community health workers' time is being spent directly with families and how much time is needed to offer the supports for them to be successful in their roles. On an, a biannual basis, we'll be requesting gross reports. So this is really more high-level overview data looking at, you know, the percentage of folks who have received CHW services by insurance type and different demographic data, just for us to understand trends and who's utilizing the community health workers, where are we seeing the opportunities for their services to be beneficial. And then we're also going to ask on an annual basis for folks to just do an end of your narrative around just like reflections on what's working, what's kind of been a barrier or difficult and how to take that information for strategies in the next year. We have included a reporting template um, and folks are welcome to use that, that are awarded. Um, folks are also able to use the details in the template to build out a way to have, you know, your electronic medical record, just pull a report for you. Our ask is just that it's an Excel form so that we can appropriately utilize it to analyze data. Beth, is there anything you'd add for reporting before I go on to the next part? Um, no, I think, no, I think let's see what, what questions come up, um, but nothing top of mind for me to add on. Okay, thanks Beth. I did just remember, thank you Beth, <laughs> that we did include something in the request for applications um, acknowledging that there is data sovereignty. And so for folks that might be um, connected to tribes or be tribal themselves, um, we do have some things in there around us being able to work together to honor data sovereignty and the reporting requirements for this grant. Uh, and this might be one of the most exciting things for everybody before we start to transition into Q&A. Again, if you put your questions in the chat, we'll start moving through um, the order that they're received. But for use of funds, the way we've set this up is that folks, again, can apply for either one community health worker, that would be either the early relational health community health worker or the K-12 school age mental health community health worker or you can apply for two and have both of those roles. If you apply for one and you were awarded, you would be able to be awarded $100,000 per year for that community health worker. And so for the two years, it'd be 100,000 for the first year and then 100,000 for the second year. If you were to uh, select and be awarded for two community health workers, it would be $200,000 per year again, for each of the years. Um, so it's really just 100,000 per community health worker per year. We do have some requirements about how these funds are utilized. Um, first and foremost, which I'm sure will not be a surprise to anyone, these funds need to be used to pay for the community health worker's salary and benefits. Uh, we also are asking that uh, the funds are utilized to provide a cell phone per community health worker that's hired and also ensuring that they have a phone plan, including texting, and then also providing either a laptop and docking station or a desktop computer. The reason we're requiring these pieces is that when we've connected with our partners at Department of Health and their community health worker advisory team um, and other folks who are really invested and connected to this workforce, these are really key components for them to be able to do their job. And we also recognize that some clinics may not be able to provide these things on their own. And so we've intentionally built into the amount awarded that you would be able to have funds to spend on these things. 
we do have some additional allowable use of funds. So, you know, you might have a supervisor that you want to allocate a portion of their FTE for the to supervise the community health worker. Um, you might want to utilize the funds for community health worker release time for them to participate in the trainings. Um, maybe mileage reimbursement. Community health workers do a lot of work out in the community, um, as well as traveling to the community health worker training. And so you are able to do mileage reimbursement. Um, there might be some minor electronic medical record updates for them to be able to document, um, covering, you know, being able to, any of the things you need to be able to hire community health workers. And then we didn't require this one, but we also did hear that it's super important as just, you know, a hotspot and plan for community health workers that might be in areas where they don't have access to consistent Wi-Fi and internet access. So there's a lot of things that these are usable fund, funds for. I will note it's not on this slide, but I want to make sure I verbally share this, that the, the community health workers and the funds for this um, cannot be like duplicated. And so you can't be having this community health worker partially funded by this grant and partially funded by another funding source. Um, and these community health, health workers need to be what's called a value add. So they can't be doing things that are already Medicaid reimbursable or that you're already submitting encounters or claims for med through Medicaid. Beth, is there anything else you want to touch on for this one? Okay, perfect. Well, that is the total of our content so far. Beth, I went faster than I thought we were going to. Um, we're going to switch to Q&A, and then I do have one more slide that I'm going to share in case folks have a couple other questions to drop in the chat, just to make sure that folks know that we are using the Pediatric Health Gov Delivery um, listserv. If you haven't already signed up, I would encourage you to do so. Um, this is how we're sending out updates and information. Uh, all of your questions will need to go to the HCA procurements email. Again, this is just to make sure that all questions and answers are made publicly available. Um, and then Beth and I are the leads on administering this grant. And so um, we're excited to hear who's interested in applying. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that Beth and I can transition to questions. Perfect. Thanks so much, Christine. And questions are, I'm off mute, I think, yep, um, are queuing up. So let me make sure I start from the top, like we said. And Beth, okay. I'm happy to read the questions for you if you want to answer them. Oh, okay. okay. I mean, we can, we can, we can both yeah. read and Perfect. answer. I'm at the first one, so I'll start with a question <laughs> Perfect. from Gloria. And that is, is there a budget as part of the application? So, Christine, I'm correct, right, that we did not ask for a formal budget as part of the application. So the answer to that question is no. Exactly. You got it correct. And I'm actually not even seeing that one, so I'm going to let you keep going. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, the next question, I, I think this is like an abbreviated name, so I don't want to say somebody's name correctly, but can you talk more about what you are looking for in the letter of support? Our CEO already approves all grant applications. I believe our section on this is very brief, which is probably why you asked the question. I think we just say it's mandatory um, without a lot of detail. We don't have a lot, we are not requesting anything very specific. I think maybe we did limit it to one page if I'm remembering. We are not expecting a full page, just to, like, you know, don't interpret a limit of one page as, you know, fill up as much of a page, but less than one page as possible. I think. Um, our desire with this is just to make sure that at kind of the highest level of, of leadership at your clinic organization, that there is um, support. But we are, it's not scored and we are not looking for anything very, you know, specific, which is why there's not more detail than that in the RFA. Christine, is that fair? Yep, that's absolutely correct. It's just to indicate that you have support from your leadership and so it doesn't have to be super detailed. And Beth, I'm gonna, I actually got a private message that came in earlier that someone just directed to me. So I'm gonna read it out to you for us to answer. Yeah. What is yeah. the grant amount per community health worker per year? And so just to repeat from the use of funds, it's 100,000 per community health worker per year. Um, Beth, the next question is, will there, additional, will there be additional training dates since the deadline for hiring is in April and the training is in February? Do you want me to answer that one or do you want to? Sure, because we've talked about this. Um, we know this is a concern, but I can't remember. I, I think this is sort of ongoing conversations with DOH, but absolutely acknowledge that we need a solution. But Christine, yeah. 
Yeah, so our hope is that we ideally we would like for community health workers to be hired by by January 2nd. We also acknowledge that we're in a time when workforce shortages and hiring can be really challenging. And so we offered more flexibility in terms of the deadline, even though our hope would be that community health workers are hired and brought onto staff as soon as possible, given the grant really is starting in January. The, the timeline for the training is currently scheduled for February um, and we're having ongoing communications with Department of Health. Um, so if we're hearing from a lot of clinics and folks like we're not finding someone, it's not going to be ready by January, then we would be trying to partner with Department of Health um, around the scheduling of that. This training is really intended for this cohort. And so the desire is to get it done as early as possible so that community health workers are prepared to do their work, but also recognizing that there might need to be some adjustments to if there's hiring challenges that people are facing. Does that adequately answer the question for folks? I know it's probably clear as mud, but. Okay. I'm gonna take lack of, of talking as that we're good. Um, Beth, the next question is, is there an expected caseload per CHW? The answer to that question is, is no. Um, I'm sure as folks who work in, I, the way that I sort of interpret this is thinking about productivity standards, which I'm sure we are all more familiar with than we would like to be oftentimes in terms of clinical providers. <clears throat> this opportunity is not framed up that way. Now, in some of the narrative responses, would it be likely that folks will talk about kind of how they expect to utilize their community health worker. I mean, clearly, yes, that is sort of the major point of many of the narrative questions. And so you may share kind of your thoughts around number of families to be served, but we do not have quotas or productivity or specific expected caseload numbers, no. Nice. Uh, the next question, if a clinic applies for two positions, could they be awarded in part or is it full or none. Our, our hope is to be able to do it as in part. We really don't know how people are going to apply, but we did um, set it up so that we would be able to award based on the different positions. So the, the answer is I, we are going to, evaluate. you could be awarded in part. So for example, if like everybody applied for the K-12 <laughs> mental health school age community health worker and no one applied for the early relational health except you applied for both, um, then you might have an opportunity to, to have the early relational health even if you weren't one of the awardees from the K-12. Beth, the next question. Oh, go ahead, Beth. I wonder, and Catherine, please unmute and speak up if you, I wonder if this is also about a partial FTE question. That's how I read that. Like could, if a clinic wants like a half-time community health worker, is that something that we would offer? And the answer to that is no. Right, Christine? You're right. So that may be- Please drop not, in the or, chat if that's what you were meaning instead. <laughs> but the answer is you could, nope, that it was answered, Beth, we're good. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah. Um, Rachel has asked, hello, thank you for this information. I have a few questions. Number one is, in the case of a partnership between a clinic and a CBO, am I understanding right that the primary care clinic must be the applicant? Yes, the primary care clinic must be the applicant. Um, number two, is each site limited to one of each type of CHW, or could a site apply for two EHR, uh, early relational health, for example? Beth, I'm gonna let you answer that one. <laughs> yeah, the way we have it, that's a good question, Rachel. Um, the way that we have it framed is as if a clinic is applying for two, that it would be one in each arm and that we would not be allowing two community health workers for one applicant um, to be in either of the, so we would not allow two school age um, and or two early relational health. It would be one or it could be one of each. Beth, I'm gonna let you take this next one too. Yep, Do all want. funded community health workers need to be new roles at a site or could the funding be used to sustain a role that has previously existed through other expiring funding, not Medicaid reimbursement? So this is a little nuanced, Rachel. I mean, Christine talked about that if, you know, we are not gonna allow a scenario where a CHW funded through this grant is also simultaneously funded through another funding source. So technically, I think what you're suggesting here would be allowed. It seems tricky and somewhat serendipitous that there would be funding that just expires like right before this funding comes through, but possible. And, and maybe 
there's been a way that clinics have bridged um, SCHW role, like there was philanthropy funding, for example, and there hasn't been for, you know, a period of time and now this opportunity comes along, like that would be, that would be fine. But the community health workers are perfect. She's like, stop yeah. talking. <laughs> okay. um, the next question is, I can take this on Beth. When completing the application, are the numbers for patient counts to include fee for service only, or can they include Medicaid managed care patients? So the numbers, this is a really great question. So I'm glad you asked it, Jamie. When we, even though the requirement is that you need to at least be serving fee for service, that's just to make sure that folks are also serving our fee for service and our Medicaid, our managed care population. For the questions that are asking about your patient counts, they are asking about your pediatric patients overall. It doesn't matter if they're fee for, for sorry, I should answer this question better. There's a question that asks for your total pediatric population. That's your total pediatric population. For the priority questions that ask about the percentage of your pediatric population, that is Medicaid, that is for your whole Medicaid caseload, regardless of if they're managed care or not. Um, and for the like non-English or non-white, that's the percentage of your pediatric population at, that qualifies as that as a whole. Um, for CHWs, for CHW supervisors, can part of their salary be on this grant and part of their salary on another grant? So we do not, this grant is not solely to provide funding for supervisor positions. It's just that you can allow some of that buffer funding that's beyond the benefits and buff, beyond the salary and required use to um, cover some of that FTE. So there are no restrictions around how else you're paying for your supervisors. Uh, Beth, the question is, who can be a supervisor for CHW, social worker, physician, health navigator, clinic manager? Yep, I just looked this. This is good we're both doing this because I was like, I can actually look up the definition. So the definition, so in the RFA, we have a pretty a substantial definition section um, and the supervisory role. So there's more definition, but the role in the clinic. So what we said will most likely be filled by someone with a social work or public health management background and maybe a licensed healthcare provider or someone holding a clinic leadership role. So that is how we defined it. So could it be a social worker? Yes, a physician? Yes, a health navigator? I, if they meet the other criteria in the definition, um, I think that would be possible, a clinic manager. So I would just reference the definition. And then if you continue to have doubt or question, you can always email to the procurement inbox and we can give you more tailored feedback. Christine, do you have anything to add to that one? Nope, I think that that sounds really good. I can yeah. get the next one. Um, statewide, sorry, I shouldn't have been double tasking. I got the next one, um, I'm at it. Thank you. <laughs> is, is there a job description for the CHW? And we do have a job, an example job description um, on the website that folks can reference and build off from. Um, there is not a requirement that you match it exactly, but that you align with the roles and responsibilities that we've displayed in that. Uh, how many clients will be served by each CH, CHW? That is something that we're hoping to learn um, as we go through this project, which is part of the reporting requirements. So we do not have a specific number required. And do you anticipate one CHW per county? Um, we are not doing the scoring based on um, that, like one county versus the other. That's not how our scoring is set up. Our scoring is with those prioritized questions and the narrative questions. And so in theory, it could end up with all of our CHWs in one part of the state just because of how we did the scoring, um, but we're not doing one per county. Um, I think I understand this next one, Beth, but I might need your help on it. So the social vulnerability areas shown on page 34 appear to include parts of South King County which seems to make sense given the CDC social vulnerability website shows tracks in South King County having high social vulnerability scores. Just to confirm, do you regard some of South King County tracks as socially vulnerable and relative to this application? So the way that we did social vulnerability and Beth might need to help me with this is that we base it on the counties identified, not the census tracks. And so the, the map is associated with the counties, but it also includes some details around census tracts. And we're just basing it off from the county. So the list that you see on the page um, is the table of counties that are identified as socially vulnerable in Washington state. Beth, is there anything you'd correct on that? No, I mean, I could just add, you know, we, we had to make 
a decision around because SVI on that the site that's included that hopefully everyone has looked at or can look at um, includes both a census tract map and also a county map and we acknowledge that there are differences between those. Um, so what we try to do with not only the SVI category criteria but the other is really to 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 balance to try to get some balance in terms of our goal and, and the intent of the legislature and the proviso um, in terms of serving more vulnerable marginalized populations. So just to acknowledge, yeah, that we, we decided to use the SVI county map. Thanks, Beth. Um, Laura asked where one would find an, an organization find their statewide vendor number. And I'm gonna see mm -hmm. if Luda can answer that question. My understanding is you might not have one already. You might have to create one, but Luda, is there something we could put in the chat around where to register for a statewide vendor number? We might have to circle back and let everyone know because I'm not hearing from Luda, so that's okay. Um, oh, there we go. Thank you, Cody. I appreciate it. Oh, we're gonna get a link now. Luda's working on getting the link for everybody. Thanks, Luda. Okay, um, I'll, I'll read the next question perfect. as we get that in the chat, just because I know there's still new messages and we would love to get to as many as possible. Um, Carrie, if you missed this, that's okay. Everyone's busy. Yes, you can be awarded both um the birth to five and the k through 12 at the same time and you should see more detail around that in the rfa um well we said our company is interested in collaborating with the primary care setting is it possible to share information to contact who are you asking to contact will lead someone specific i think if the ask is can we somehow connect folks with the list of all primary care providers like i think that's something we can't not because we wouldn't want to, but we wouldn't have a way to do that. Can you come up, Mike, maybe, and clarify your question? Waleed, I'm not sure if you're able to come off mute. I I have no issue with you putting your information in the chat right now with who are who's present. I, but I, think, I okay, yeah, there you go. I am muted. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, the the question is, we are in um, in Ohio, but uh, uh, we're very interested, and uh, we're in the home community based services. So, uh, we we have a lot of uh, home community uh, or. Uh, 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 HCWs, uh, you know, or CHWs that we uh, that we have, and so if there is an entity that needs uh, that service, we're able to collaborate with them. And so I'm I'm trying to figure out what would be the best way to be able to share that information. Yeah, well, Lita, I think you can provide information in the chat. I think we're going to have to go back to our contracts team to just see what we're allowed to share and not, and kind of our communications team. It's um, We don't really have like a listserv that we would be able to just like share people's information through. So I think this is one that we might have to come back to and let you all know. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, Laura, you had what time frame do you want for a data poll? So the reporting, there's um, there's going to be data that is going to be reported on on a quarterly basis, and that will have you know client scene and duration and type of service, um, and then the gross data will be due on a biannual basis, so twice a year, um, and then we'll have an annual report on narrative about strengths, challenges, and uh, strategies for next steps. Beth, the um, next one. Oh, go ahead, Beth. Yeah, I can read and take the next one, Christine, if you want. Yeah, I've been doing so much talking. Um, thanks for your question, Rishi. Can you give specific practical examples of how CHWs are used for both of the arms? I think the most helpful, and again, I'm just looking back at the RFA, um, page six has a paragraph on both the early relation health CHWs and also the K-12 that I think will be helpful for you in giving you some general ideas around deliverables for both of those um, CHWs. Also, a lot of the narrative questions. I mean, this is a really exciting grant and it's pretty open, um, right? And so a lot of the narrative questions are around you sharing with us, like how you plan within 
the intents and the proviso language and kind of the, the required kind of buckets of services, like how you and your teams plan to utilize the CHWs to really improve health outcomes for families and population health. And so you're not gonna find super detailed specifics, but you will find information in the RFA. That should be helpful. Yeah. Um, the next one is Rachel. It says, given a situation where a clinic and a CBO or behavioral health org are doing this in partnership, can the CHW be employed by the partner rather than the primary care org? I, I would say yes. The, the, so the clinic, the primary care clinic serving children and youth birth through 18 has to be the applicant. Then they have the freedom to work and create partnerships and things like that for how they would have a community health worker be a part of their clinic care team. Beth, does that sound accurate? Perfect. Thanks, Rachel. Yep. Beth, I don't know if you want to try this one. Um, I'm happy to do it if you want. But um, Rick asked, we have a member of our integrated behavioral health team who helps families with getting referrals completed and schedule clinic visits. We're hoping to transition this person into a CHW role. Could she continue in her current role as a CHW? We are not currently funded for her position. That's a good question, Rick. So you have someone currently, they help families getting referrals completed and scheduled clinic visits. I think the caution here, Rick, would be, I'm putting myself in the shoes of this person who has what I'm sure is a busy full-time job, um, getting referrals, doing close with referrals, it sounds like, and scheduling visits, reaching out to families. So how will that work be transitioned away from this person if now the intent of their job um, is shifting, you know, not totally though. I mean, I I think in terms of the RFA for you all and your team to really think through, it's just, is the, the job description going forward of this person really going to align with what the CHW RFA um, is asking for CHWs to be, to be doing? Um, I wanna caution folks that it is, you know, these are very relationally based roles um, and we would be very hesitant about funding um, for things that seem administrative, largely kind of phone work or kind of existing roles that people, I mean, here's the reality. I think we all know that clinics are very stressed and need a lot of help and resource, totally acknowledge that. And this CHW role is not gonna be a silver bullet, obviously, um, or, you know, shouldn't be used to kind of fill all the, all the needs and holes in the system. It really needs to be, I mean, our goal is to find ongoing funding um, for community health workers. And to do that, we need folks to be used uh, in line with what the intent is of this legislation. Yeah, I would say, Rick, I would encourage you to look at the example job description that's in the RFA and post it on the web page and see how that fits with the role. And that might help with guiding your decision. Can I, can I just clarify a little bit? The, yeah, the, for sure. That team member specifically worked with mental health and, and birth to three developmental issues. Um, that's her her role. So that those specifically, those are her clinic appointments and and work work uh, load. So that might clarify a little better that that is sort of what she does. Rick, I, and I totally trust you. I would just say, we can't say yes or no if that's gonna be a good fit for you. I think that you all will have to review and then certainly are welcome to apply if you feel like it's a good fit. And if they're not also like funded in another capacity, I don't think that that'll be a challenge as long as you are aligning with the scope of work and job description, which um, it sounds like you feel like it would be a good fit, but I would defer to you and your team to know if that's a good fit. I. I can see we're going to run out of time. So let me, the definition of primary care is in the definition list on the RFA. So I'm just going to refer you to the definition list. Um, in question two, just. And just, just to clarify, so I put the definition in the chat. You can find definitions in the RFA. That's early on at the beginning. And we also have a definition, the same exact definitions posted on the community health worker webpage. Um, so the definition that we're using, I put in the chat for folks. Um, in the question 2H, do you expect the allocation of four activities to be reported and number of hours per week or percentage of time? We did not restrict that for folks based on, you know, for you, it, we literally talked about this, um, that like some, Beth might think in percentages and I might think in hours. We can certainly, I think our evaluators are smart enough that they can understand and interpret. So please respond in the way that fits for you and your program in terms of answering in hours versus percentage. 
Beth, do you want to get this last one? For Elizabeth? Um, yeah. Yep, Elizabeth, this is a popular question. Yes, yeah, so the the award is going to be the, the CHW and the award and the funding. I think this is probably largely around funding. It's going to go to a primary care clinic. If that primary care clinic chooses to enter into partnership collaboration with the CBO and the CHW um, is an employee of that CBO, we are not restricting that, but it would be between your primary care clinic who would be the awardee and really the accountable or responsible um, person for the grant deliverables and requirements. But then how you would coordinate payment um, with the CBO, that's, that is not disallowed. That is, that is fine with us. We have about four minutes left. Does anyone else have any other pressing questions? If the goal is to serve the most needy patients, there are large differences among the total number of pediatric patients different primary care groups serve. Can you consider adding the total number of Medicaid patients in addition to just the percentage? Amy, just to clarify, the goal is to really be um, elevating the, the composition of the clinics, not necessarily the volume of the clinics. And so we intentionally made a choice to make these about percentages rather than the total volume so that we are not disallowing clinics that might be serving less families, but still a, a large population, a diverse population and composition of Medicaid clients. Are there any expectations that the CHW would be assessing patient eligibility for Apple Health? Beth, do you want to answer that one? We didn't, that's not called out. Um, I, I think that's that's likely something that CHWs will be engaging in, but again, it will depend on the needs of, of the clinic and of the community. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a required component. Awesome. Um, the, the, to the question of the recording, this is going to, the RFA also has the link to where this will be posted on the HCA YouTube page. We're not going to be sending it out directly, but folks will be able to access that link there. Um, and we can work with our communications team around sending out a, a Gov delivery through the Pediatric Health Listserv for you to be able to find where to access it. Um, it will be, it can take up to a week. So sometime next week, it will be uploaded for folks to be able to review. And then Beth, do you want to take, if awarded the grant, is it a lump sum payment or is it a reimbursement for hours or other deliverables? Um, I'm trying to remember, it is not based on it? hours. It's not based on hours or deliverables. It's a lump sum. I think we said it was, yeah, Christine, what did we decide? Yeah, That's so we, we decided that um, you, like when you submit your grant reporting quarterly, that is what will indicate that you'll that you have done your job so that we can get the funding. So that is the like accountability measure, but we are paying, um, like we'll pay, like when you hire the CHW, you would get paid at the beginning of January to be able to pay the CHW. Um, and then when you pay your reports, then those will be how we send them out. Um, but it is not based on service delivery or deliverables. It's you, you get the 100,000 <laughs> for the year, no matter what, the way that you make sure that you're in good standing with your grant is to submit your grant reports quarterly. That's probably the best way to say it. And I'm actually gonna put the link in the chat for where the recording will be posted sometime next week. Any other questions? We covered a lot of questions. <laughs> All right, if folks don't have any other questions, you're welcome to start hopping off. We're gonna be closing out. Um, we appreciate you joining. Like we said, all of these questions submitted today will become um, a part of an amendment that will be sent out to everyone so that folks are able to reference them written. Um, so thank you for joining because your questions will make sure that our uh, request for applications is more helpful and uh, supports folks in knowing what's allowable for this project. So thanks. <laughs>